Welcome everyone. We'll get just we'll get started in just a moment here. Thanks so much for joining. Welcome, welcome everyone. I see folks trickling in. We'll get started in just another moment. All right, I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, thank you so much for everyone who's here today and especially thank you to Lorena and Dominique for joining us today um, and Nate as well. Um, today is our first Ask Me Anything um, running for office while LGBTQIA+. Um, we're so excited also to have um, Victory Fund as our partner. Um, just a little bit about Run for Something. Um, so my name is Neha. Um, I'm a Run for Something staffer. I've been with Run for Something for about a year now, um, helping progressive candidates um, get the tools and resources they need to actually take that step and run for office. Um, Run for Something recruits and supports passionate, diverse young progressives, 40 and under. Um, we have three amazing alumni um, who have been with Run for Something and Victory Fund here today. Um, Run for Something candidates are running for their first, second, or third time in down ballot races. Um, and it's because we believe that young, diverse, and exciting progressives running strong grassroots campaigns at the local level um, helps to increase immediate turnout for our communities and make the change that we want to see. So we've helped over 147,000 people start thinking about running for office and we've won over 1200 races. And especially this year, we're really proud to share that over 27% of our um, endorsees were LGBTQIA+, over 53% were BIPOC and 50% were women. I would love to pass it over to Sean to share a little bit more about Victory Fund. Hey everyone, I'm Sean Malloy, Vice President of Political Programs at LGBTQ Plus Victory Fund. Uh, we are the only group in the country that is dedicated to supporting pro-LGBTQ, pro-choice, out LGBTQ candidates from uh, at all levels of the ballot. Um, and so uh, we've been around for almost 35 years and uh, have helped elect um, thousands of candidates. Um, you can see some of our record just from the last two years right, an even year and an odd year, but uh, both years about 71%. So our endorsement criteria, uh, you've got to be out, and you've got to be fighting for the full diversity of our community. You've got to believe that fundamental right of privacy, including reproductive freedom, um, but you also have to have a plan to win. Um, and that is uh, exactly um, what we look for um, with partners like Run For Something. And we're so excited to be doing this again. This has become a tradition um, uh, uh, with Run for Something to do a Pride Month thing for some of our amazing shared candidates. So thanks so much for having us and uh, thanks so much for being a great partner. Thanks, Sean, appreciate that. And today we'll be um, answering questions live through the Q&A feature, I forgot to mention that. So please, um, once we open up questions, um, you'll be able to submit them through the Q&A feature only. Um, please don't put them in the chat, they'll get lost in there. Um, we do wanna hear from you in the chat. Feel free to um, type and respond to questions. Um, if you're responding in the chat, please make sure to select everyone instead of just host and panelists so that everyone can see um, what you've put in the chat. All right, I'll kick, kick it back to Sean who will um, help introduce our speakers today. Yes, I'm very excited about all three of our speakers, all of whom are endorsed and supported by both Run for Something and LGBTQ Plus Victory Fund. Um, some have experienced winning and some are on their way to winning. Um, and so excited to talk to them about what it takes uh, to run for office, um, as well as about their experiences as LGBTQ people. Um, you know, we are severely underrepresented in government. Um, just over 1,300 uh, LGBTQ people serve in total across the United States. Um, and, but we are 7.6% of the population, Gen Z, 
um, right, uh, is about 25 to 30% of the population. So excited to see that 27% number um, of the candidates run for some things we're working with, um, but we've got a long way to go. And so uh, excited to talk to our panelists here. I'm gonna introduce them in order um, and uh, ask them to tell us a little bit about their story um, and what took them to run for office. Um, and then we'll uh, we'll go through all of them and then we'll get to the questions. Um, but first we have Dominique Clemens uh, from the Genesee County Clerk and Register of Deeds in Wisconsin, uh, the key state of Wisconsin. So uh, Dominique, please tell everyone uh, a little bit about your story. Hey everyone, uh, actually from Michigan, uh, Dominique Clemens oh, here, shit. Genesee I'm County so sorry. Clerk. <laughs> That's fine. Neighbors close by in another Great Lakes state. Um, but good to see everyone. Uh, again, my name is Dominique Clemens. I have the honor of being Genesee County Clerk and Register of Deeds here in Genesee County, Michigan. Um, that is here in my hometown of Flint, Michigan. I know a lot of folks have probably heard of that. And I, I think like many folks, first ran for office, actually first ran for county commissioner um, because of a lack of representation in my community. As someone that had recently graduated college, I took a look at the Board of Commissioners and saw in a community that I grew up that is a predominantly Black community, that the folks that were representing us were predominantly old, cis, white men. Um, and that I felt that my needs and that my interests weren't being represented. And that's what got me to first run. Um, some weird events happened in our community that led me to become appointed as County Clerk Register of Deeds. And now I'm on the ballot for that position this year. Amazing. Thank you so much. And apologies. I knew it was a pivotal swing state and I, and, and in the Midwest and, and I mixed them up. I apologize. Um, but moving to another pivotal swing state um, down the way in the South, excited to introduce State Representative Verena Austin of Arizona. Hey, everyone. Thank you, Sean. Um, it's so amazing to be here. Uh, I'm so grateful for organizations like Run for Something and LGBTQ Victory Fund. I don't think I would be in the position I am today without y'all. So I just want to give you a big shout out and to everyone here. Uh, wonderful support systems from those organizations. My name is Lorena Austin. I'm state representative of Legislative District 9. And I serve the people of Mesa and Tempe. I am a fifth generation Arizonan, and I am so proud to serve the district where my family has lived for over 100 years. So super rude in the community, come from a family of uh, farm workers, uh, civil rights activists, and I was a former educator before uh, running for office in our Maricopa Community College system. So education is really uh, the foundation of, of why I came to uh, run, but also because in 2022, redistricting happened in the state of Arizona due to the census, and it created a brand new district literally cut perfectly of my hometown. And I was approached by one of my best friends. I was supposed to go to law school. I was applying for law school at the time. And she said, hey, you should run for office. And I said, no, that's wild. And she then said, no one from our community is running. People are just moving from crowded primaries from different parts of the state to have an easier pathway to the legislature because there were open seats. And that's why I ran, because I thought that someone who looked like our you know, community who understood our community, who had always, uh, you know, advocated for it should be representing us at the state legislature. So in 2022, I was elected as the first Chicane non-binary legislator in the entire country. Um, I didn't even know that was going to happen, but it, but it did. And right now I currently serve in the House of Representatives here, where in Arizona, we are literally down by one seat in each chamber from tying and two away from flipping. So Arizona is one of the good going to be one of those massive swing states you'll you'll be seeing on the news uh, constantly. But uh, it's a very important race and just so happy to be here to share my experience with you all. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. And now moving to the other side of the country in the South, um, we have Nate Douglas, who is running for the Florida House Representatives in District 37. Welcome, Nate. Hey, how are y'all doing? Um, I'm so glad to be here, and um, I'm very happy here, um, Lorena, that uh, Arizona is so close to flipping. That's really exciting, actually. Um, here in Florida, we are not in the same spot, but we are so close to getting rid of the Republican supermajority, though. We're just five seats away. Um, now, I may sound a bit off. I just came from South Florida. Um, I was at Pride. Needless to say, I'm a bit under the weather right now. But I am so excited to be in this panel, though. And, you know, part of what got me running, y'all, is, 
you know, I was born in a working class family. Both my parents are immigrants. My dad is a small business owner from Jamaica, and my mom is a public school teacher of 25 years from France. And they both met at Disney, actually. And I was born on Disney property. So I'm an all around Disney baby. Um, and I'm running for House District 37, which represents one of the, I think it's either the second or the first, it flips sometimes, the largest universities in the country, um, which is the University of Central Florida. And, you know, I just, one of the most vivid memories I have as a child is walking into the kitchen and I would see like a stack of envelopes on the kitchen table. And I would look at my mom, she would look at me and she know that moment that your parents have fear in their eyes. And she would look at that stack of envelopes, she would look at my dad. And, you know, that was a year that was really tough for us because that was the year that my family almost lost our house. And that's like millions of other middle class families across the country. So my mom became a um, my mom became a um, worker at Universal Studios part time as well as teaching. And my dad then started his small landscaping business and they could still barely make ends meet. And, you know, the reason why I'm running today is because I'm seeing much of the same issues that started that crisis back in L.A. We're seeing a real we're seeing a um, financial crisis in Florida. We are the hotspot for inflation. We have the fastest growing homeowners insurance rates. And right now, instead of dealing with those issues, our state government is taking corporate dollars and they're just giving three billion dollar bailouts to large insurance companies and nothing back to working class families. And then on top of that, they're crushing our LGBTQ plus community, they're busting our unions or getting rid of black history. So it's really important that we get rid of that supermajority here in Florida, and we bring back economic freedom in Florida, um, we bring back economic fairness, and we also bring back freedom for our LGBTQ plus community here as well. So thank you for having me. No, absolutely. And I hope Pride was a great time and uh, just a, another happy pride to everyone um you know uh yes uh, very very exciting times and more important than ever um and so i'm going to go ahead and get started with some questions um you know uh you've all ran uh, or current you're all currently running as well um and so wanting to to see you know off from the stop the top how has your identity impacted your campaign? And that doesn't just have to be your LGBTQ identity, but your actual identity all around. Um, how has that impacted your campaign? And uh, we'll start off with uh, Dominique. Yeah, I think that's a great question to start off with because identity is such an important thing. Uh, and for me, my identity is a very intersectional identity. Uh, I identify as a bisexual male who is also multiracial um, and has a um, varied religious background. And I bring my identity, every aspect of my identity with me every single day, both in the job and on the campaign. And that's something that really took some growing into. Uh, prior to running for uh, the position of county commissioner, which I first ran for, I had done a lot of identity work. I was director of diversity, equity, and inclusion for the Michigan House of Representatives and really leaning into that, but was still having a hard time embracing the fullness of my identity, especially having such an intersectional identity on walking into places and feeling like I had to turn on the light switch at certain times of a certain identity or of another identity, um, when really it wasn't until within the last couple of years running after I ran the first race and realizing I can be my authentic self, my true identity all of the time. And it actually has helped in my campaign that I'm being more genuine in, in every space that no matter who I'm speaking to, I am half black, half white. I am biracial, a member of the LGBT community. And this is who I am. And the events that we have on our campaign, the conversations that we have, the policies that we're enacting, all are reflected in that identity. Uh, amazing. Uh, uh, Lorena, I'll go ahead and, and uh, hear from you next. Sure. I think for me, it was something when I, you know, filed to run, I knew immediately that was something that I hadn't really, I think, thought through all the way um, was how I was going to kind of talk about my identity and my campaign. So it's a really good question. 
but I think it just was natural to me that I, I wasn't running again to be the first of anything or running because I was part of the queer community, you know, first and foremost, and I think this is important for so many candidates. Um, I'm running because I love my community, but I also have worked very hard uh, before even considering running for office. So it wasn't like I just decided to be part of my community. So when I went to doors, you know, I was very conscious of what I look like, right? I mean, you probably can't see me, but I have I'm full sleeve, tatted, I have a lip ring, you know, I'm brown. When I show up at doors, that's kind of the first thing I kind of have to diffuse when someone opens the door to me. But for me, it became apparent very quickly that once I started explaining, you know, I'm actually from this community. My family has lived here for X, Y, Z years. I work at our local community college. I really did more of an icebreaker of, oh, how long have you lived here? And that really just uh, cut the tension by a lot because I think just overall in general, I can clearly say in my district, I don't know that people are so concerned that I am part of the queer community. They're just concerned that I actually know our community, that I know what it takes to stretch a dollar for our families, uh, that I know the organizations that are um, available to them and the resources and how can I help them? And so whenever I've come from that approach and that's the only way I do come from it, I don't start with like a policy question. I start with, hey, you know, what what is important to you or how long have you lived here? What do you do? And just, it just builds off of that. And so I just think being authentically yourself was the best thing I ever did, right? And I never lied about who I was or tried to be someone different just to fit into the stereotype of what a politician should be, because honestly, people aren't looking for that anymore. They're looking for authentic people with real lives who understand the issues that are impacting uh, our families the most right now. Absolutely. Um, our government needs to look more like the people's men represent in order for that to happen. So thanks for being part of that. Um, and Nate, uh, we'd love to hear from you. That is such a fantastic question, Sean. Um, and thank you so much for asking that. Um, and I think, you know, something that I definitely face as a Gen Z Black queer candidate in the state of Florida, you know, there's so many stereotypes around, you know, different aspects of my identity that are just so important to combat. And I don't only have to, and you know, what's been difficult is not only having to combat that, you know, from the right side, but even from, you know, within my own party, for instance, that's supposed to be open and accepting. There's still folks who, you know, have, you know, inherent biases um, that are really hard to counter. And, you know, it's really about, um, you know, continuing to run, um, continuing to be proud about who you are and your identity, you know, being proud about the fact that I am a queer Black man and um, being able to run this campaign the way I have been running it so far to combat, you know, those stereotypes and the issues that I faced um, since the beginning of the campaign. And then obviously, you know, outside of that, there is like, you know, there is that, that move toward extremism that we're seeing in certain parts of the South, um, especially in Florida, you know, um, especially being a queer candidate. Like I saw that, um, you know, I think it was um, Sasha wrote in the comments about having a non-binary roommate with a transgender child. Um, obviously we're seeing so much of that within the media. We're seeing so much, you know, anti-trans hatred right now going on. And then we're seeing, you know, hatred expanding to all of the letters in our LGBTQ plus community. So, you know, something that I, I you know, know that um, I, I'm going to continue to face um, throughout, you know, this, um, throughout this campaign trail is, you know, just those outdated stereotypes about me as a Black man, first of all, and then as a gay person, you know, constantly being called a groomer from those on the right side, um, you know, just, just facing, you know, um, things like that. And it's really important that we continue to run and we show who we are and we take pride in it and we show people that we are just like them, that, you know, as working class folks from a di with a different identity, um, we are exactly like them. It's, and it's really important that we focus on how we can uplift all of our communities. Um, especially in the state of Florida and uplift all of us economically as well um, and focus on the issues that really matter to folks instead of focusing on useless culture wars that our state has been promoting. Yeah, useless. Um, it's an understatement, I would say. Um, and uh, when there's so many other issues going on um, in the country and then also certainly in Florida. Um, but moving from your identities, but this question directly relates to it, we've got a couple different versions of it. Um, 
you know, how would you suggest someone gets started? Um, you know, how did you get started? Whether, you know, considering your different identities? Um, and then did you have governmental experience, um, you know, before you even started running? Um, and we'll go ahead and that same order, Dominique, if you'd like to start. Yeah, so my start, uh, a little bit unique, but probably not different from a lot of people. Uh, I was very involved with my community here in Flint during the Flint water crisis and helping uh, provide additional resources and support to my community while I was away at college and doing fundraisers at college to bring funds back home to do water drives to help in those causes. And at that time, I was going to school for political science and thought maybe I would be the campaign staffer. I was that background person, never the person, and at least in my opinion, that was going to run for office, be the public face of anything. And I was encouraged by members of my community uh, to run for the county commission seat when my commissioner was retiring. And my first thought was it wasn't really my thing. And they said, well, you need to go to some of these commission meetings. And in going to some of those commission meetings, as I uh, mentioned when we first started, I recognized that nobody at those meetings, the decision makers, looked like me or had similar thoughts to me. So made the decision to run. While I did have some background in government, spending some time working in our state legislature, never had ran for office. And the first things that I did was reach out to organizations that had like-minded individuals. Run for Something was one of the first places that I reached out to get the support on how to run a campaign, how to run an election, how to get elected. And then once winning that election, the hard job of governing and doing the job, um, I was lucky enough to get reelected as a county commissioner. And then uh, literally two weeks after the election, resigned from my seat as county commissioner to be appointed to a higher seat as county clerk register. Um, which is where I'm at now. And those things I've learned from those organizations like Run for Something and the support that I've gotten in my re-election and my election now from Victory Fund has really set me over the edge. But just being able to have conversations with community, and that was the thing that really got me was it took some convincing that the people around me, the community, I didn't think I had what it take, took to run for office. I didn't think I was that person to be out in the forefront and my community thought otherwise. And the first time I ran, I ran against someone with a whole lot of political experience, someone that who had been in office before. Um, ironically, I was the youngest person to run for county commissioner in our county at the time. And my opponent happened to be the oldest person to ever run for county commissioner. I was 27. He was 86. Um, and the pandemic happened, which gave me a little bit of an edge doing digital. Um, but it really, it came down to the encouragement of my community and the support from organizations. Wow. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks for winning. Thanks for winning. Um, uh, Lorena. Yeah, I think uh, for me, I had never even worked on a campaign before, uh, before I was kind of approached to run for office. But again, I had been very active in the community. I actually was a student government advisor at our local community college here. So in that vein, um, I've now learned it's very different. So now if I ever go back to that job, I'll have a very different perspective from my student, <laughs> um, which is great. Uh, but also, you know, I had always been the one of the first people to jump into action if something needed to be done. So especially, especially when COVID hit here in 2020, um, I came back to college much later in life and I was graduating that same year when COVID hit and I just jumped into action. So that meant helping do intake for those 3000 cars a day for few distributions for families. I uh, did a lot of work with a local uh, restaurant here to provide PPE supplies um, and food for indigenous communities up in Navajo nation. So I had been very active and I think that's why in 2022, I was like put on this list of people to approach for, for this position. Uh, but then again, this district when it was created was also uh, the most competitive numbers wise, there's nothing closer. So it's a third, a third, a third uh, Republican, independent and Democrat uh, for our district. And also, though, if you know Mesa or anything about us here in Arizona, it is a very traditionally conservative uh, place. But and that meant that they ha didn't think we would win, that they thought I had no chance in hell of winning this race. So they didn't really put resources in, into this race, uh, but also when I, you know, signed up to run, I didn't know what I was doing. And so thankfully, 
and it just happens stars align too. I'm in a tier, what they call a tier one district, right? So that means that it's very noticeable that this district either has a likelihood of flipping a seat or gaining seats here in the in the Arizona legislature. So because of that, I, I was provided some support uh, from our party here and that was just incredible, but it also connected me to organizations like Run for Something and uh, LGBTQ Victory Fund. So that was great. So that's something that I would suggest, you know, if your party has resources or connections, uh, but this is exactly the type of thing, right? Knowing that these types of organizations exist to help the intersectionality of candidates, uh, because it's very important that we have that type of support. Um, and it's really neat. And I'm just noticing that you all like partnered and joined on this, which is which is amazing. And I think that just shows uh, the impact it can have and how important these races are and how important it is to have representation. And I know we hear that a lot, but it really does make a big difference. Uh, you know, when you're sitting in these you know places of power and people are continuing to drop these laws, but all of a sudden now you're sitting there and you have the same voice. Um, and same level of power as they do to an extent to really combat this hateful rhetoric that we see. So it was such a wild journey for me. It was something if you had asked me two years ago that I would be a representative, I would have said, you're out your damn mind because that's just not that's not in the cards for me. But I think you really have to be open to the opportunity. And if a door walks, uh, a door opens, you got to walk through it. Um, and just look for those resources and organizations like this to really help you. And also, too, this is such a great place to network. So, you know, exchange, you know, uh, information. And I, I know personally, I can put my information in the chat. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Amazing. Uh, constantly showing leadership. Uh, and Nate. Um, I absolutely love that answer, Marina. I think that was um, fantastic. Um, um, you know, I first ran for office at 18 years old. Um, I've been involved in climate advocacy since I was a freshman in high school. Um, one of the first organizations that I'd been involved with was uh, Sunrise Movement. Um, and, you know, when I was 18, I decided it was around um, the COVID-19 pandemic, actually, when I decided to first run. And um, I ran against someone from who was the president of a chamber of commerce um, and someone who is a good friend of mine now, who is an educator, just like I was um, vice chair of a um, teacher's union. And, you know, when I first ran, you know, I didn't raise much money at all. Um, I was definitely outraised. Um, but I knocked on doors. Um, that's what I did. I knocked on almost every door I could. And I ended up winning a three-way race with 49% of the vote. And that was, you know, telling folks, you know, um, what what I believe in, like the like like uh, an Orange County, Florida, that has more mass public transit and Orange County, Florida, that switches to renewable energy. And, you know, um, coming into 2024, deciding to run for state house, you know, obviously I ran for soil and water and that was in the office, you know, where I got hundreds of thousands of votes. But that was definitely nothing compared to running for an office like state house where, you know, you have to raise a ton of money. Um, it's a swing seat. So, you know, there are questions, you know, um, some of the criticisms I got from the beginning was, you know, you're too progressive for this district. Um, I'm an economics major from UF. So um, a lot of what I talk about is, you know, progressive economics. And it was like, you're too progressive for the district. You're too black for the district. You're too gay for the district. You know, so many different um, things. But, but, you know, there were still so many folks, though, that really believed in me from the beginning. Um, like I could speak to one of my, like one of my mentors, um, Congressman Maxwell Frost, who, you know, encountered some of the same exact type of, um, you know, doubts when he first ran for office, when he first ran for Congress as well. Um, and then like Kevin Lada from Leaders We Deserve, who was one of my um, best advisors who helped connect me with so many different orgs, you know, amazing orgs like Run for Something and um, LGBTQ plus uh, Victory Fund as well. And, you know, I just think that, you know, running for office, it is something that is not easy at all. And especially, you know, being part of our identity, oftentimes, you know, we make these decisions on our own. Like I was not a recruited candidate. And, you know, when I first ran for state house, I was like, oh, you know, it's just run for office. 
you know, until all the criticisms came pouring in and they were like, yeah, you're probably not going to win this. You're probably going to get primaried. Um, but, you know, I, 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 I did, you know, what any I think Gen Z are running for office does, which I, which is, you know, um, I worked my ass off and um, and 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 I worked to get, you know, gain support. And I and I listened to my mentors and um, and I think that's why I am where I am today. And um, that's why, you know, we're going to prove, you know, the naysayers from before wrong and we're going to flip House District 37 and we're going to win it back for Democrats, but also not only Democrats, but through a grassroots campaign that doesn't accept corporate donations and one that runs on progressive values that are extremely important. Amazing. Uh, and so I think we've got a couple questions actually about, um, you know, identification, right, progressive, liberal, how you run, how you talk to to voters and then also how you govern um, and how those all kind of interplay. I don't know if you all could like, share a story or kind of your approach um, and kind of how that ties into your district. Um, uh, Dominique, um, if you'd like to start, we'll, we'll go to you. Yeah, I think the success of that all depends on the district of where you're running, um, but also what your beliefs are. Um, I would like to believe, I don't know if it's necessarily the reality or not, that folks of all sorts of identities have a place in all of our major political parties as well as the third uh, third parties. I did not find that necessarily to be the case. Uh, I identify as a Democrat, but I grew up as a Democrat uh, in a labor household uh, born uh, to a mother who was a social worker and a father uh, who, stepfather who uh, worked in the auto industry and in General Motors and was a member of the UAW. Um, so really grew up with those policies and principles. But looking at, and that was a conversation that I had to make when I was running, while I grew up as a Democrat, what did that really mean to me and the policies that I stood for? Um, do I agree 100% with everything that my party, the Democratic Party, puts forth? No, absolutely not. Um, and depending on where I go, I get labeled as, as different things. In my community, which is a very blue collar union area, uh, we are all Democrats. And most people here in my area would tell me that I am a pretty far left progressive Democrat uh, for the sake of Genesee County, Michigan. However, I know if I go just about anywhere else in the country, uh, most folks would see me probably a little bit more middle of the road. So those labels of progressive or liberal or moderate really are regional and really depends on where you're at. All I can say is, you know, this is what I stand for. I believe that every human being has the right to love who they want to have. I believe that every human being has the right to their own reproductive freedom and health. I believe that unions are the backbone of America and we need to expand our economy from the middle out, not from the top down. And those are the things that make me who I am. I believe that we need to be supporting our community with community benefit agreements, but also looking out for what's happening across the world and standing strong for those people, those countries and those individuals that are continuously facing oppression, including what we're seeing happening to the Palestinian people. I don't know if that makes me a progressive. I don't know if that makes me a moderate. It depends on the community, I guess. Indeed, indeed, Lorena. Yeah, I don't know that I could say it better, Dominique. It was amazing because I think it comes down to, and I, I say it all the time, do you know your community? And there are a few candidates running right now for different positions in my district, like school board and things like that. And I can tell you right now, the ones that I'm impressed by and the ones that you know I'm going to support because they're they're where I am. I see them in my community. They're at different events um, and not just like city sponsored events, but uh, they're out volunteering. I'll see them around. I'm like, oh, they're actually investing their time in district and they're actually talking to the people and curious about what problems you know they're facing and having just conversations, you know, with people, instead of just assuming you're going to win the seat based on whatever party affiliation you think is going to win. Uh, so for me, you know, I, I'm a, I run as a Democrat. And, um, you know, that's because here in Arizona, it is it is such a two party system. Um, and that's just a reality in terms of even 
even fundraising or things like that. It's not something that I'm happy about uh, because an example in my district, I have to raise, you know, like half a million dollars almost uh, just to be viable in such a competitive district. But also I work with organizations like I am a working uh, families party candidate, uh, which if you haven't heard of working families party, uh, they are a very working class, probably more seen as progressive, uh, you know, state party uh, in different parts and mostly in the East Coast. It hasn't really come out to, to my, you know, area here out in Arizona, far West, we're still the wild West out here. Um, but I think that speaks to, you know, my priorities as a leader. Um, and, you know, I don't think of myself as, oh, you know, I'm just a Democrat. I'm like, no, I'm here for working people. You know, I struggled in my youth growing up and understand what it means to to live in, in Section 8 housing, you know, and understands what it means to um, have to prioritize different, you know, uh, if you're going to have food that day or not, or when you're going to have it, you know. And so I think it's just really important, again, that you understand who you're serving and I think that will go such a long way past party affiliation because at the same time for me, again, I grew up in, in, a, in a more conservative space and place. So it's not it's not weird for me to have conversations with Republicans because that's just where I grew up. Uh, so, yeah, I think to Dominique's point in some spaces at the Capitol, you know, they think I'm the most far left progressive you've ever met. And, you know, you would label me as just this wild, extreme, maybe person to some people. But then if you really know me and, you know, you'll probably see me, oh, that you're kind of middle of the road and you're really reasonable and you can have conversations with anyone. And that's really important to me. I don't refuse meetings from anyone uh, from my office, regardless of their opinion. And even if we disagree, because if we don't start having conversations, we'll only see the disconnect grow wider and wider. Uh, so for me, I just show up as as myself and see where that takes me. And and so far, it's 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 done all right. So that's kind of my my take on that. Thank you, thank you, Nate. Anything to add? Hey, so yeah, I think that's a that's a very great question. So um, I I am I am definitely um, more on the left end of the spectrum. I am a progressive, and you know, here's the thing: a lot of progressive values are very popular in Florida. Um, time after time, amendment ballot amendment after ballot amendment in Florida, we've seen progressive values win. But then, you know, when it comes to names on the ballot, we've seen a lot of Republicans win, and a lot of what they've passed have been actually very unpopular amongst Floridians. But it's just about, you know, how do we reach those voters? I mean, for instance, there's so much misinformation um, in the state of Florida that a lot of voters are getting. Um, a lot of voters are turned off by elections because of, you know, the, the, the nasty rhetoric, or simply they just don't believe that there's anyone running that represents them. And it's really about getting that message out to them. You know, something I tell voters um, at the door every single time I knock on the door is, you know, I talk about, you know, who, what, what the current state legislature is doing. And time after time amongst Republicans, amongst MPAs, and obviously Democrats, what they've done is really unpopular. I've spoken to so many Republicans. I've told them, you know, our state passed a... Um, passed a $3 billion bailout for large insurance companies, and we have the fastest rising insurance costs in the country. And then they're just like, oh, well, it's time to vote the current incumbent out, even though, you know, I'm a Republican. Um, there's someone who actually, who's actually fighting, you know, to for, for working class families, not for large insurance companies or big developers. Um, and I think that's something that's really important because at, that, at this point, you know, um, something I talk about a lot is, you know, culture wars have gotten so in the way of things and it has been used to divide people, especially Floridians like Ron DeSantis is one of the people who spread the term, you know, woke the way that it's used today um, around the world. Um, you go to places like Poland or Russia and they're using the word woke right now. Um, to describe or gender ideology, you know, phrases that Ron DeSantis, you know, kind of coined or helped coin. And all of that is just a distractor. It's been used to divide people. 
because what people are seeing is what Ron DeSantis wants them to see about, you know, um, about, you know, inappropriate books or whatnot in schools. But what people aren't seeing is what they're actually doing, which is getting rid of um, climate change and our um, resolutions and our state laws. We've seen them um, stripping away um, LGBTQ plus rights, but also at the same time, stripping away so many others' rights, like educators, for instance. My mom's an educator of 25 years, and we're seeing a teacher, a massive teacher shortage because of the laws passed in Florida. Um, we're seeing, like I said, a $3 billion bailout for large insurance companies. We're seeing them putting multiple preemptions on our local um, our local governments and getting rid of our right to actually vote for the ordinances that we want in our counties. Um, and we're seeing them hand everything to, you know, their big donors, their corporate donors. We're seeing them boost the fossil fuel industry. You know, voters are not getting that message because right now our state government is just blindsiding them with a bunch of culture wars and that's it. So I try to tell voters, you know, this isn't about our differences. It's about where we lie, like where our commonalities are, which our commonality right now is we currently have a state government that is not doing the right thing for our people economically. And right now Floridians are struggling across the board and our state government is contributing to that right now. Um, so I think that's really important that we just continue to push a progressive economic message forward because that is very popular with voters. Um, and it's really important that we lean into that and we let them know, you know, the culture wars is a distraction. Absolutely. We've consistently seen across the country, right, when uh, progressive economic issues are on the ballot, um, that they get passed even in, um, same thing with choice measures, right? It, they, get, they get passed, right? When folks can't distract from the actual basic, uh, you know, what's outlined there, um, those issues win. It's really those distractions that truly have um, uh, stopped uh, so many folks from, from winning. Um, so we've got so many amazing questions, but we're not gonna be able to get to them all. Um, you know, a couple questions about navigating uh, parties on either side, right? Whether they're good old boys on the Democratic side or the Republican side. Uh, and then also like, you know, looking at running outside the party system. Um, any, you know, experiences you've had or, or thoughts there? And uh, we'll go back to, to Dominique. There's no such thing as a good old boy from Michigan, right? <laughs> Um, I think they, when there's an opportunity to run um, on your values, run on your values, regardless of what party that is. Uh, some races naturally are nonpartisan. Uh, so I know in Michigan, most school board races, many city council races are nonpartisan. You don't run as, as either party. Um, but the reality is, I think Rep. Austin mentioned it, in some seats, in some districts, in some communities, you have to run as a party to win. Um, and while it is important that we stand on our values and stand on who we are, we've also got to do the work to win the race and do the damn thing. Um, because if we are choosing to stand so strongly on not identifying as a certain party in a certain way when it's just not physically possible in the math to win, we're not going to be able to be the be in a position to have the representation that we need, not in the position to make the decisions um, we can, as I mentioned, we can call each other and label things what we want, but we've got to do what it takes to win the race and then get in and do the work of what our values are. Um, and as far as party goes, I mean, I know that's something I faced even within my own party. Um, the Democratic Party, the establishment, they didn't want me running when I first ran. Many folks thought I was too young to run. Um, many folks didn't like the identity that I had. My district uh, with the Alameda County Board was a very diverse district. I felt that I represented our district better than, quite frankly, the old white folks that had represented it before. Um, but there were those conversations that were had with individuals, and it took a lot of work for me to convince uh, the power players to support me. And in many cases, that convincing just led them to staying neutral. And in some cases, I had to accept that, right? That getting a power player to stay neutral sometimes is just as good as getting someone to support you in an election um, as opposed to supporting an opponent. 
Um, and that's the unfortunate reality that I think a lot of people of color, a lot of people in the LGBT community face, and a lot of young people face is going up against that establishment of identity and just this is the way that politics has always been done. I ran on a platform of changing the status quo, running on true identity um, and what the issues of our community was, and it resonated with people. But I did have to do that within a party structure. Thank you, uh, Lorena. Yeah, I think for me, because I was not a part of politics per four per, before per se, everyone will tell you everything about how they think you should do it and who you should be friends with, who you shouldn't be friends with. And I didn't know who anyone was. So people come to me and like, oh, this person's exited. I'm like, I, I don't know who they are. I literally don't know who you're talking about um, because either those people are in different regions um, Phoenix is a very big city, obviously here in Arizona, and I'm, <clears throat> excuse me, a little bit east of that. And so, um, <clears throat> sorry, it's really dry in Arizona, so, and allergies, and it's like 110 degrees outside, so I guess it's infiltrating my house. Um, but yeah, I think overall, it became very apparent very quickly that I would have to kind of navigate politics in the way that you just navigate life and relationships. So, right. I mean, you kind of have to be, just be mindful and um, when you're having these conversations, but also again, just being authentic to yourself, I think is just so incredibly important here. And like, why are you there? Um, what are the issues that are important to you? And, and really listening to your gut has been something that uh, I really take to heart. And, and, you know, for example, I don't always vote in line with the Democratic Party. Uh, we just passed a budget here in Arizona that I said no to, uh, even though the Democratic governor of Arizona wanted us to all vote for it. Um, it, it did not have, you know, I think the uh, items that it needed to ensure that Arizona's were really going to prosper, you know, it was really influenced by by Republicans and and cut a lot of funding for our education systems and social services. And, you know, you know, and maybe people say, well, why didn't, you know, vote for it? Because so it could be more bipartisan. I'm like, well, it's not. Um, that's not how it was presented to us. And and I'm not going to, to to bend and act like I'm not here for, you know, my people, why I came here. And I think um, regardless of, you know, you know, people can be so worried about getting reelected sometimes. And that I think really clouds their judgment and their focus. And for me, being a legislator is not my identity. And I'm grateful to say to years in that it, it's still not something that um, is going to change my mind. And if the people of my community don't want to send me back here, then that's their prerogative. But while I'm here in this seat, I will do what I think is right and what's best for my people. And so you have to stick to your values, uh, first and foremost. And you know, to me, office can't be about just getting reelected. And yes, it's important that, you know, we're getting majorities, uh, but but people want to see real people. They want to see authenticity and you have to be authentic um, in this space and how you serve. And that really does shine through to people. Um, so I try to be inclusive and I post videos about what's happening and explaining to people what's going on. And people really appreciate that because for the first time for so many of them, they they don't know what's happening or going on in our state legislature. And it should and it that should not, you know, be the case. So I think sometimes I've seen it. People just get caught up in 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 what's next. And if, you know, I don't come back here, then I don't make change. But to me, that says, you know, then you don't know what um i don't know that's maybe personal but for me if i don't win i'm going to go back and do the same thing i've been doing which is working in my community that will never change that will never stop um and so i just think it's something that you have to navigate and again people will tell you what to expect as a candidate people will give you all of the pieces of advice but you really truly do not know what it's like until you do it and you will just have to learn along the way you will make mistakes um, but you have to adapt and and push through those. Uh, but but please just sincerely just be true to the reason um, for why you're running. You know, what are your values and stick to them. And I promise you, people will respect that more than you think. Absolutely. Uh, a wise uh, woman who happens to be Victory's Fund CEO, former Houston Mayor Anise Parker, says, you know, uh, being in office is a tool. It's not a place to be. And uh, I think that that's very much in line with what you just said. Um, Nate, um, if you have any thoughts. Um, Sean, could you repeat the question? Yeah. Um, so basically uh, around um, the 
a party infrastructure, right? Whether it's running with it, against it, right? Independence, you know, that kind of thing. Okay, gotcha. Um, well, I, I, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna echo what um, both Dominic and um, and and Lorena said, which is, you know, it, it's really important that you stick to your values. Like, I think that you know, the story Lorena gave, for instance, was a good example. Um, voting on a budget that even the Democratic governor of Arizona wanted them to vote on. You know, it, it, it's really important that, you know, um, Lorena stuck to their values and um, understood, you know, I, I don't want to vote for a budget that, you know, provides cuts for public education. Um, I, I don't want to vote for a budget that, you know, just, you know, it's basically a, 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 a right wing budget that is, you know, draped in the word compromise. Um, you know, I think it's really important that that that's just how legislators vote. I think it's important that they follow their values and they follow the values that they ran on, um, which is extremely important because that's what the people voted for. And if you vote against something that the rest of the party wants you to vote for, but, you know, you ran and you said, I'm uh, like, you know, these are my values and that bill goes against the values. I think it's really important that you follow through with it and you make sure that voters know your intentions behind voting or why you voted a certain way. Um, and I think that, you know, that's why, you know, I always I constantly try to post videos, you know, about what is going on in the state legislature in Florida and make people understand, you know, what's going on with the bills, what's the true intention of the bill. How would I actually um, vote on a bill like that if I was in the state legislature, making it pretty obvious. Um, but I think it's really important that we just follow values and it's not, and while it is important that we stick with our colleagues and we advance, you know, bills from the Democratic side, for instance, it's really important that we try our best to make sure we shift the Democratic Party, for instance, more toward one that represents the values of working class people um, and, you know, doesn't cave to corporate interests. Um, I think that that's something that is really important. Amazing. And I think that's a, a great way to, to wind us down. I know we did not get to go to uh, to get to everyone's questions, but I did put um, a uh, survey, the largest survey ever done of LGBTQ candidates talking about the obstacles they faced, how they dealt with them and so forth. Uh, the our C3 partner, the Victory LGBTQ plus Victory Institute completed. Um, and then uh, I think we have um, a, a couple slides to take us out, correct? Yeah, thanks so much, Sean. Um, and thank you so much to Lorena, Dominique, and Nate one more time. Please just give them some love in the chat. They were all incredible and in just Amazing. sharing their experiences in running to, for office and just living out their values um, in such unique ways in each of the states that they represent. So um, please, please um, give them some love in the chat. And I know that we didn't get to all the questions today. Um, feel free to send any questions we didn't get to to campaigns at runforsomething.net. Um, we will send out some follow-up materials um, to everybody who registered, which will include a full recording of this training or of this webinar. Um, we'll have some resources from LGBTQ Plus Victory Fund and from Run for Something as well. So you can learn a little bit, a little bit more about our organizations and endorsement process. And I think um, both Lorena and Dominique put their contact in the chat. So um please connect with them. And just wanted to give another shout out to everybody who joined today. Thank you so much. And we're excited to see you all in the future. Thanks so much. Thanks everyone. Happy Pride. Happy Pride.